Hello, everybody. Welcome to our monthly lecture. This is Chad of Northern Virginia and Washington, DC. My name is Cheryl Gedzelman, and I am on the board of Chad. I want to tell you a little bit about Chad before I introduce our speaker. We have a Northern Virginia and Washington, DC chapter, which is part of Chad National. And our chapter is very active. We do three main things. One of them is providing a monthly lecture most months of the year, except for the summer. And that's usually the first or second Tuesday of the month. And we'll be telling you about the next lecture at the end. And another thing we do is parent support groups and adults with ADHD support groups, which you could find on Meetup. And these support groups are ongoing and they are on Zoom. And then the third thing is we still like to have one thing in person, which it used to be that everything was in person, but now we have one thing in person and it's once a year we have an annual resource fair where we have a lot of sponsors who, and they're all people who work with people with ADHD in different ways. And the sponsors come and they have tables and we also have a speaker and it's a really wonderful event. It's in October. So those are the main things that we do. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Jeff Kranzler is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and holds a master's and PhD from the Wurzweiler School of Social Work. He specializes in working with autistic individuals and has created and runs Kranzler Autism Programs and Services called CAPS, which is a neurodiversity affirming and celebrating practice that teaches social skills, mood regulation, anxiety management, executive functioning, interoception, growth mindset, confidence building, and more. He has served as the social work supervisor as of an Albert Einstein College of Medicine clinic, a dean of students at a large K through 12 school in South Florida, and has been performing therapy in a variety of settings for more than 16 years. Dr. Kranzler is also the author of The Crimson Protector, a superhero adventure novel that teaches tweens and teens how to build confidence overcome social anxiety and handle bullying. Welcome, Dr. Kranzler. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody who is here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so let's get started. But before we even get into it, you know, the, the title that, that you, you saw, um, as well as the title that's up on the screen right now is Autism and Bullying, and we're at a chat event. So what are we doing here? Um, and so um, there, there are different studies that show uh, different rates um, in uh, individuals who are autistic. Uh, those individuals have between a 28 and 70% chance of having ADHD. And those with ADHD, different studies put the rate anywhere between 20 and 65% as being autistic. Um, and that is, um, both those figures are extremely large ranges which to me says we really haven't gotten a good handle on that just yet. What we do know is that they co-occur. Um, and even without that, um, there, is a, uh, th there is a term called neurodiversity, neurodivergence. And that includes individuals who are autistic, individuals with learning differences, individuals with twice exceptional learning, um, and those uh, with ADHD. So there is a lot of overlap. There are very, very clear differences uh, between all of those pieces and there are pieces that appear across the board. Um, and, um, and so this, this talking about autism uh, is very relevant here at Chad, as well as bullying. Um, as we know, um, individuals who have ADHD are targeted, um, and people who are autistic are targeted, and, uh, and we're going to talk more about that today. Uh, we're not only going to talk about what autism is and what bullying is, but how, um, how we help uh, autistic individuals. And um, with that, and I think a lot of that um, is very, very similar uh, to helping uh, everybody uh, deal with bullying, um, but certainly also individuals with ADHD. So uh, the way we're going to work this, I'm going to uh, do some presenting. I'm going to stop every now and then and take a couple of questions. So please uh, feel free to post questions in the chat. And uh, any questions that I don't, you know, answer um, every now and then, uh, we'll have time at the end of the presentation to uh, uh, to answer them. Uh, so let's get started. Okay. And for some reason, uh, here we go. All right. Neurodiversity versus the medical model. 
Uh, there is a belief set that uh, autism is an illness uh, and it is wrong. Uh, autism is not an illness, it is a neurological difference. Um, and we at CAPS and really the people who are doing the right work in the field believe in something called neurodiversity, which means that um, in the term for autistic people are as, uh, as neurodiverse, neurodivergent, again, which includes other pieces, uh, which includes learning differences, which includes ADHD, and those who are not are called neurotypical. And uh, the reality is, is that it is not an illness, it is not a disease, it is simply a difference. A difference, by the way, that is uh, often not served uh, by the world at large, um, but it is not an issue with an individual who is autistic. It is an issue with the world that is built by, frankly, and for uh, neurotypical individuals. Um, Talk about autism pride and nomenclature. So you'll, uh, I think you'll notice by now that I uh, have not said with autism or has autism. I've specifically used the word autistic. Um, and there is a shift uh, in the field uh, to be talking about uh, things in the, as the word autistic. Everybody has the right uh, to be, to refer to in the way that they want. And um, there is a, a sense of that um, the word autistic is much more affirming. And the reason is because if you have autism, it's like you have something you can get rid of. Autism is a integral part of a person is. It is not a, you know, and, and some people are like, well, we're not going to do use deficit-based language. Well, that's only if you believe it's a deficit, right? But if you do believe it's a different autism, uh, we do believe, I do believe that people who are autistic should be proud of it. Um, and so the, we use the term autistic, uh, versus with uh, autism. Um, so let's talk about the neurobiology. We're talking about neurological differences. So there's a lot of different pieces about the neurological differences. Here are a couple. So the first is uh, between autistic people and non-autistic people. So the first is pruning. Um, in all of our minds, we have connections between neurons. Um, those help us uh, gain access to information that we need. Uh, there is a belief, and I, I do believe this, that if a piece of information is correctly encoded the first time, you actually never uh, lose it. It is encoded in your memory forever. If you can't remember it, it is not because it's not there. It's because you do not have a connection to the piece of, uh, to, to, to the part of your mind that has, um, that has encoded it. Uh, and the reason for that is pruning. Your brain gets rid of unnecessary connections between neurons. So if there is a piece of information that has no much, not, not much use, haven't used it in a while, the connection is gone. And the reason why that occurs is because, well, it frees up the mind to make new connections uh, and, and incur, incorporate new information. There is definitely a lack of pruning or a lesser level of pruning in the autistic brain. Um, and what that means is that taking on new information can be more difficult and holding on to previous information, as well as incorporating information that is directly on focus with one particular uh, piece that there's an interest in, uh, becomes a much more of a strength. Again, this is not an illness. This is just an area of difference of strength. Uh, Hyperconnectivity, there's lowered process of speeding, uh, lower speed of processing. Um, and again, encoding new data is difficult, as well as new data that is not related to a specific um, area of interest. Um, as well as very often there is a lower uh, speed of processing. Um, there are strengths and there are challenges associated uh, with uh, autism. And this is a really important phrase. If you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, and with a lot of, um, you know, different categorizations out there, there is, you know, a lot of commonalities. Um, indiv autistic individuals happen to be extremely uh, individual and it's very difficult to um, describe everybody um, in any way. And so we will we'll discuss different aspects of things, but to preempt that, um, it's very important to know that this is not across the board, that an autistic person is, one autistic person will look extremely different than another one. And I'm not even talking about across uh, the, the spectrum uh, for people who are more, um, uh, uh, more uh, in, uh, deeply impacted versus those who are less deeply impacted, but across the board, even uh, within that spectrum in the same um, areas, everybody is really uh, an individual. Uh, so we're, we're not going to go through all of this uh, at, at once, um, but the uh, diagnostic criteria of autism, and this again, this is 
This comes from the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual, right? And again, it tends to, it has to be, has a, a kind of very negative and pejorative uh, piece to it, um, you know, and, uh, and um, this is how they, they classify it. And there is a lot of strengths as well. So let, let's start with the, the, some of the challenges. So one of the challenges is in communic social communication, understanding um, social cues, um, having um, effective back and forth conversation, uh, sharing interests uh, and emotions, um, and responding to social interactions, right? Um, there is pieces in, as I said before, nonverbal communication, uh, again, which is picking up cues, things that are not uh, said, rather um, uh, body cues and situational cues, um, and uh, difficulty in um, maintaining relationships, sharing an imaginative, uh, sharing imaginative play. Um, and there's also a focus on rigidity too. Um, there's a, 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 autistic individuals often really struggle um, with being flexible, uh, things needing to be a certain way. It's very difficult. It's not a, a sense of um, oppositionalism or being difficult. It's that it is extremely hard uh, to handle new things or to handle changes when they uh, occur. There are areas of specific interest, um, and uh, they're, they're focused on more with less attention to a variety of interests. Um, and there's also uh, often a sensory component as well. Uh, there is a sensory component as well. Um, either I, and, and people make the mistake thinking that it's only hypersensitivity, but there's both hyper and hyposensitivity uh, to uh, various uh, the various of the senses. Um, so let's let's actually start at the end. Let's talk about the hypo or hypersensitive, right? There are eight senses. We all know five senses, right? Um, and th and th those are our basics, but there are three more that people uh, do not actually speak about, which are really, really important and actually uh, pop up in the neurodivergent population across, them, right? So there's sight, smell, touch, uh, sight, smell, touch, taste, um, and, um, and, and hearing. Right. But there is also uh, so let's go to the three that people usually are not talking about. So the first is the vestibular sense. Uh, the vestibular sense is uh, has to do with balance. Uh, the essence of it is located in the inner ear. It is knowing where you are in space. Uh, proprioception is the other one. And that is knowing how much force you need to use in order to engage with an object and where you are in relation to those objects. Um, and the one that pops up most often is interoception. Um, and um, I know when Cheryl, you know, uh, read out that introduction, used the word interoception. Um, interoception is the ability to pick up your inner cues, both physical as well as emotional. And those are located in the organs. So people who struggle with interoception will have a hard time knowing when they're hungry, when they need to go to the bathroom, uh, when they're in pain, but also from an emotional sense will have a struggle in picking up what the emotions they are experiencing. And in fact, it takes training for the physical end on the part of occupational therapists. And on the emotional end, occupational therapists can do that as well. But therapists can as well work um, on that particular piece. So when uh, we are talking about autistic individuals, there are going to be challenges uh, social across the board. Um, there's going to be sensory challenges, there's going to be flexibility challenges, and there's going to be a focus on, on one or two very specific areas of interest and a difficulty engaging uh, with other pieces. And that's easy to look at that from a deficit per deficits perspective, but we can also look at that from a strength perspective as well. Uh, let's take the hyper focus on one or two things. Um, I always tell people that, um, that, that LeBron James is not the greatest hockey player. I don't even know if he plays hockey at all, but it also doesn't matter because he's the best at basketball, right? And that's really what counts, right? When you're really putting your heart and soul into something, it allows you to thrive there more. So the very thing that can get in your way, the ability to engage about a variety of topics um, is also a strength because it allows you to focus and really excel and exceed at one. Uh, let's talk about hypersensitivity. In today's world, it is absolutely a difficulty. We live in a world of constant bings and beeps and and alarms and all of these 
uh, noises. We are constantly wearing new clothes. We are constantly eating new foods. It is really difficult to have sensory sensitivities in 2020. However, hundreds of years ago, when that wasn't the case, sensory sensitivities, it wasn't that they didn't exist. They didn't really pose so much of an issue. You, um, you, wore, you were born and died in the same suit, as the, as the uh, saying goes, right? You pretty much had the same diet. You knew the same people. You had the same routine. Um, and uh, that actually was um, less sensory uh, overload there, as well as, uh, frankly, there being less of flexibility necessary. Your life was very much the same. And there is a constant um, uh, you know, uh, feed of new experiences, new needs, new, um, you know, uh, new requirements to engage in. Um, and in fact, hyper, so what's the use of hypersensitivity? So there's actually a, a, um, a theory called the night watchman theory. And the night watchman theory, this is about, um, that was that autistic and ADHD individuals were actually the night watchmen for the tribes they were in. And why does that make sense? First of all, Many of our neurodivergent individuals are night owls. Um, second of all, if you are a guard in the middle of the night and you can only focus on one thing, you're going to miss things. However, if your attention is immediately grabbed by one, um, uh, by 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 uh, a a rustling in the woods or a sound over here, if you're picking up things in the dark, you're going to be the best person to protect your clan, your tribe because you're picking up all of the different stigmas in the uh, stimuli in the, uh, in the environment. Um, and, um, and so they're having hypersensitivity actually allows you in, in, uh, in a much more of a natural way to uh, pick up things that other people may not be picking up. Uh, a lot of our uh, autistic individuals have a very high sensitivity to sound, which in today's world really messes you over. But hundreds and thousands of years ago was incredibly important for staying alive, um, and um, uh, and and in terms of uh, in terms of socializing, uh, again, that hundreds even a hundred years ago, but certainly thousands of years ago, you grew up with the same clan. You were not introducing yourself every single year to consistently new people and having to talk about completely different things. So a lot of these pieces that are spoken about in a very uh, negative and derogatory way, not only do they make sense, not only are they evolutionarily necessary, they in fact are assets um, that, uh, are, are, that the world needs. We need people to be the best at what they do and very often neurodivergent individuals happen to be the best at what they do. Um, and so, um, uh, before we go on to other considerations, I want to just uh, stop here for a moment. And uh, I know I've thrown a lot uh, out here and take uh, one or two questions. Hey, Jeff, this is uh, Terry Bullis, one of the board members. There was a question early on about the fact that autism is referred to as a disability. And how do you talk to kids who know that they have this quote unquote disability, but you know, we want to talk about their autism in an affirming way. How do you how do you get those two things to be um, understood in, in a positive way? So I talk about autism as a community and as a tribe. And I, I, I'm very open about why people are using that. Number one, people are wrong when they say it's a disability. Right. And number two, I'm just going to be straight up and honest with you. There's something called health insurance and health insurance won't re reimburse people for something that's a strength uh, being helped out. That's where you're hearing that. Those are the two pieces that are really causing that. But let's talk about what it really is. You are part of a very exclusive group of individuals who do incredible things. And I talk to them about who is a member of their tribe. Um, it is Bill Gates. It is Steve Jobs. It is Albert Einstein. Um, it is uh, Michelangelo. Uh, and and so many more and so, so many more. And the, the common theme is that when you are autistic, the strength that you have, your capacity to love deeply a specific area and to delve into it longer, better and harder than anybody else while remembering it more and being more creative with it makes you 
it's a necessity. We not only do, should you be who you are, the world needs you to be who you are. Um, and so that's um, that's how I talk about it. And you know, for people who know me, I'm a I'm a really big superhero fan, as you can probably tell from the fact that I wrote a book called The Crimson Protector. Um, and I, I liken it to the X-Men. And I don't know how many people here know uh, about comic books, but the X-Men are a small group of individuals with, ex with large amounts of power uh, who are misunderstood and disliked often uh, by the very people they serve and protect. And um, if there is a, a connection to, to, the, to the superhero world, I often point it at that because the truth is you are different than the majority, than the majority of people. The majority of people are not autistic. You have special powers. You are misunderstood and often treated poorly. And the, without the X-Men, the world has been, would have been destroyed at least a couple hundred times by whatever uh, new menace Marvel cooks up uh, every year. Um, and frankly, the world needs you to be exactly who you are. Uh, and they need you to save the world by doing what you do. And let me take just one more, and then we're going to uh, move on. There might be another question um, coming up from Anna. I asked her to put it in the chat. Um, okay, I don't think can, she's quite posted it, but we can revisit it a little bit later. Let's revisit it a little bit later. Sounds good. Um, so let's go on. Other considerations to keep in mind with autistic individuals, oftentimes processing speed is a little bit low, uh, if not more significantly low. And so when think people are throwing things extremely fast, at autistic individuals, it has a tendency to overwhelm multiplicity. Again, the strength being able to really focus in on one uh, specific area also presents challenges when there is a ton of things put on you, which is often a re unfortunate reality of 2024. And everybody who um, who uh, practices the a practice of mindfulness and DBT knows the concept of one mindedness that the solution to so many of um, of uh, our struggles from a mental health perspective has to do with our mind being five million different places. And the solution is to bring it to more of a single-minded uh, piece. So that's actually a solution, um, one that can be very difficult in the fast-paced world now. And both of those things, as well as sensory overload can lead to autistic burnout. Um, and uh, for those people who know what spoons theory is, spoons theory is, uh, the belief that every single person wakes up with a certain amount of spoons, each spoon uh, relating to an amount of emotional and physical energy. So let's say you wake up with eight spoons. Getting out in the morning is one or two spoons. You, you, you know, going to school is four spoons, uh, right? Doing your homework, one spoon. Well, you've used seven spoons out of your eight spoons, so you got one extra. Good for you. Well, in autistic individuals will often wake up with less spoons to start with, and everything costs more. You might wake up with five spoons. Getting out in the morning is really hard. That costs three spoons. School, we have to do overwhelming, uh, you know, um, tasks, being social, being uh, organizing, uh, focusing on so many different things at, a, at uh, an incredible speed with topics that are really of lack of a little interest um, and are very difficult might cost you seven spoons. Well, if you woke up with six, then you're in the hole before you even get home. And so a lot of individuals who are autistic get burnt out. Um, and a very uh, key piece is um, uh, is something called radical uh, downtime, the ability to rejuvenate themselves. Um, but being aware that the world is really hard, the 2024 world is really hard um, and really drains autistic people is something to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, and then again, when working with autistic individuals, it's really, it's, you know, the, it's, you do not want to change somebody. And this, this is this very fine line because there are advocates out there um, who are doing amazing work in changing the world and working with legisl legislators and working um, in the uh, in the general public um, and trying to change the world to be more uh, open to friendly and conducive to autistic individuals. And oftentimes advocates will be very against uh, utilizing any skills whatsoever to uh, change anything. You be who you are. Don't, don't you do anything different. And on the flip side, you have the medical mom. You're broken. Change things. And in the middle is you're amazing the way you are. And you live in a world that was not created specifically for you and is not being run in a way that's conducive to you. So learning a certain set of skills to navigate 
This world is going to be of use to you. Utilize skills to navigate, to get what you want, not to change who you are. And again, it is a very, very thin and fine line. That is what I believe is the absolute necessity because I do want the world to change tomorrow and it's not going to, and it's not going to change completely and enough in 20 or 30 or 50 years. And I do not believe in sacrificing the individual on the altar of societal change. Uh, two, I do not want somebody to change who they are. So working with autistic individuals is about being who you are and learning a way to navigate a system. I say very much if you go to law school, it doesn't make you a different person. It gives you tools to navigate a legal system. And that's what uh, that's what we are doing. Um, the world needs autistic people to be exactly who they are. If autism went away, planes would fall out of the sky. Uh, our legal, our uh, financial, our entertainment, our uh, uh, financing, our, the entire world would fall apart because the people who are simply the best at what they do generally are autistic or neurodivergent. Before we get into, so that's kind of in, in, in a nutshell, um, kind of the, the autism piece that I wanted to cover today. I want to get into um, the, uh, the bullying piece, um, but I just want to stop for maybe one more question before we get into uh, the bullying piece. And Terry, I don't know if you have, uh, if you have one. If not, we can go on um, to the next piece. There's a discussion that I'm um, sifting through, but at the okay. moment, there are no specific questions that I think. Uh, not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. Let's keep going. Then. So what is bullying? OK, so we need to talk about what bullying is and what it is not. There are three components to bullying that need to be present in order for it to be considered bullying. It needs to be repeated. A one-time thing is not considered bullying. It needs to be intentional, purposeful in its attempt to lower somebody else and to raise the person who is engaging in the bullying. And there has to be a power differential, meaning the person doing the bullying has to have more power in one area. And it doesn't necessarily have to be physical, size, strength. It can be in um, social uh, um, uh, you know, capital, uh, somebody, but there is a power differential between the person doing the bullying and the person being bullied. Now, if something does not meet these criteria, it does not mean it's okay, right? Unkindness and teasing and all of those pieces are not okay, nor should they be tolerated. And we need to be on the same page when we're using words uh, to know that we're we're using the correct terminology because when we're talking about bullying, we're really talking about a purposeful, repeated attempt to gain power no, uh, through the subjugation of somebody else. Um, let's talk about what's not bullying. Uh, when a child gets irritated and makes a mean comment one time, right? Somebody said that and everybody laughed at the other person and that was it. That's not officially bullying. Two students on equal or social or physical standing getting angry at each other. Um, fighting and insulting each other, uh, students who do not like each other, not wanting to include each other in their own personal activities versus, let's say, a bullying would be getting other people to not include them. But if two people are in two separate groups, again, not good and also not bully. Um, who, who are bullies and what do they want? So let's talk. Um, OK, I think somebody. Uh, yeah. OK, great. Um, so who are, who are bullies and what do they want? So everybody makes this big mistake. Oh, bullies, they're people who got bullied themselves. They're, they're, they're struggling. They're, they're really having a hard time and they're just, they're taking it out on somebody and they don't, they don't really get it and they're just baloney. That's absolutely not what the literature shows. In fact, bullies tend to have higher than average self-esteem, average or higher than average grades, higher than average social skills and social status, and use bullying as a power producing tool. You will not be a good bully unless you have extremely good social skills because a bully that doesn't use uh, social skills well will just fail. They might punch a kid a couple of times, they'll get in trouble, they'll get knocked off, right? But it's the kids who know enough to trigger somebody and do it subtly in a way that keeps them from getting in trouble and gets the other person going consistently, you need to have high social skills to be a successful bully. And so what bullies are not doing is expressing the pain they have inside. Might be some, sure, okay? 
but they're utilizing it quite rightly as a power producing tool. Why? Right? Why do people people happen to be um, attracted to those who um, can provide protection to them? It's uh, an, an internal uh, and an essential human need. So bullies actually, by putting others down, gain cachet because they're the person doing the harming and can be perceived as somebody who can protect. And by the way, well, that, that's why people flock to bullies, right? It's dangerous for you to be on the bully's wrong side. And there is a natural human uh, comfort with somebody who can be uh, physical or dangerous. Who are the targets? Those who are different, those who are now protected by social support, and those who show the most obvious impact of bullying. Guess what? I just described neurodivergent individuals. Um, especially with autistic individuals, they're often uh, being e easily able to be picked out. By the way, you become a target for whatever reason if you are different. In fact, they've shown that cancer survivors are targets of bullying. Right? If you're coming in with um, without hair, people will come after cancer survivors. Right? Anybody who is different is on the radar screen. It is harder to bully somebody who has a lot of friends around and a lot of our neurodivergent kids are lonely and isolated, all right? And a lot of times, especially with our impulsive kids, they happen to have the most extreme reactions to bullying, which is the goal of bullying and therefore makes them the, uh, the, better, the, the more intense target. Autistic individuals, uh, ADHD individuals are at greater risk of being targeted by bullies. Now, we're gonna talk about uh, various things that we can do but one thing has to be clear, it is never the victim's fault. And no matter what we give strategies for people to do, whether it's schools, individuals, the thing that needs to be clear is you can never do anything that makes you deserve abuse or victimization in any circumstance. And that is a really important uh, uh, preface to any work that you are doing with a uh, related victim, um, or, or any um, component of the, of the matter. And that, that is really, really important uh, to keep in mind. So uh, let's talk about bullying is an institutional problem, right? Everybody you know, thinks that, uh, okay, there's this, this kid and he's doing the bullying and it's the kid who's getting bullied and we gotta, gotta work with those two. Um, and that's just not, not right. Bullying is created in an institutional environment. Um, it is an institution where bullying is either ignored, uh, allowed to occur, or unintentionally, or even intentionally, uh, encouraged. And the best results, not saying the only results, but the best results in dealing with a bullying issue is dealing with it on an institutional level. Again, it doesn't mean it can't be done individually, but the best response is on an institutional level. Let's talk about schools because we are talking about schools and there is, I, I know there is a whole field out there about bullying in the workplace and that's not something I'm touching on today. That's a completely different area. But let's talk about where the schools need. So number one, there needs to be a system of centralized reporting and documentation. Um, that is uh, the, the entire staff needs to be engaged. If you have two people looking out for bullying, it's not gonna work. But when the principal and the teachers and the lunch ladies and the custodians and the uh, support staff and everybody is on alert and knows what to do, that's when it makes a difference. Um, interactions between teachers and teachers and teachers and students, there is at times bullying between teachers and students. And oftentimes teachers can bully each other and that is seen um, uh, often. There is a need to design and disseminate clear, the flexible systems of escalating consequences. Um, and what, what that means is it needs to be clear to everybody. Of course, there have to be handbooks, but it needs to be done well. I think most schools at this stage probably have a handbook about bullying. The question is whether it's done well or not. But in any case, this, uh, there's an old way of thinking about things called um, zero tolerance. And it is an absolute and utter failure. And if any school is using it now, they are decades out of date. Um, a zero tolerance policy does not work. Uh, escalating consequences do. Um, and uh, escalating, escalating consequences, again, requires that first uh, dot, that first uh, point on the uh, slide about a system of centralized reporting and documentation, because what works best is um, responses to repeated 
um, uh, events there. Um, proactive prevention programs, it's not just about um, having that strong basis of response to bullying, but it's about having prevention programs as well. And students need to very much be involved. And it would be even better if the students led the initiatives. Um, here's what you don't do. You don't put a bully and the victim in the same room and mediate. Mediation, uh, it, peer mediation is not for bullying, right? What if you take, uh, take an abuser and put them in the room with their victim and you would tell them, hey, why don't you guys work it out? Well, that, that's what you're doing and that's not okay ever. Um, a lot of people make a very big mistake. Let, you know, we're having a bullying prevention program. Let's get the bullies involved. Let's put the bullies in the position of stopping bullying. That's how we'll get them involved. No, that is how you actually increase the amount of bullying. And having one parent of the victim calling the bully's parents is not how you address it. Right? The way we address it is from an institutional uh, perspective. I'm going to, um, uh, so before I go on again, just checking one more time for questions. And if not, we can keep on, keep on going because we do have a bit more to go to. I think we should keep on going, Jeff. There is something I'll bring up at the end for discussion. Okay. Perfect. Let's go to the end and then we'll do all discussion. Um, so teaching bystanders effective ways to address. So a lot of it is um, the, the biggest change happens when the students who are not involved, they are not the bullies nor the victims, are trained in ways uh, to get involved effectively. Um, and there are multiple things that they can do. Um, and um, and those those include, by the way, reporting. That include being able to st stand up and say something. Uh, it can include standing up and voicing in opposition to what's going on. Um, it can be distracting the bully, taking the victim out of the situation. Um, even leaving the situation uh, can be very effective because, again, bullying is meant as a power play. And in order for it to be a power play, it most often occurs in sight of other students. And when they don't do something, again, that leads to the belief set that it is okay with everyone. And even student coming up to a victim after the bullying and talking to them then and saying they didn't approve of it can be incredibly effective, incredibly helpful. But that is part of the institutional work in training the bystanders, um, or as some call them, the upstanders, the non-involved uh, students in that particular interaction to get involved. Let's talk about what you can do as parents uh, of victims. There are a lot of emotions that are caused when you're hearing your child being bullying, bullied. It is extremely upsetting. Um, and there are some things that as parents we can do to better help our kids, avoiding rash behavior. It is the desire of every parent to protect their child. It'd be odd if you didn't have a desire to do everything in your power to eliminate it altogether. Um, be careful about jumping on it um, and just being rash and doing something as opposed to thinking things through. Um, showing the anger and sadness, there is validation and we want you to validate the emotions, but if you're getting super worked up when your child is telling you about bullying, there's a chance that they are not gonna feel comfortable saying it because they're seeing your distress. Um, we're gonna talk about encouraging connection with social groups because again, uh, being part of a social group can be protective. Um, we're gonna talk to people about and I, I hate that term, but snitching or whatever it is, telling on people versus reporting and talking about the difference between snitching or telling, right? Telling, you know, reporting on somebody who's, you know, not, you know, causing any harm to anybody and you're just doing it for the sake of it versus reporting some really important harm. That's both for the people who are being victimized as well as people who are seeing that. Developing confidence in reporting. Uh, what parents can do is figure out who at the school is actually good. And again, this is very difficult because there are different levels of competency across different schools. And your school might be fantastic in how they deal with it, or they might have complete and utter incompetence, either from an organizational perspective or because of personnel and figuring out where you can go, who you can go to and how things work is a really important piece there. Um, there is a process when it comes to bullying. The first time it happens, things are going to be addressed, but it's not going to be ended. The way things get addressed is when there are repeated reports about this. Again, bullying is repeated. And if the, after the first report, oftentimes things get worse. And in a good organization, there is put on the table to those who are doing the bullying that if there is re reprisal for reporting, 
there is an additional level of response. Um, but it's going to take two or three or four reports. Again, if your school is doing the right thing, if not, there's other pieces to talk about. Um, being calm, firm, and consistent contact with the school. You don't. You want to be able to be there and to put things into writing so that you have a, a document trail of what you've done, what your child has reported, not waiting. Uh, and of course, bullying can lead to an incredible amount of um, mental health struggles. So reaching out for professional help if you're seeing uh, depression and anxiety uh, coming across strongly. Um, teaching an effective response for the victim. So this is actually a, a, a kind of a modified from uh, the peers curriculum. So that's a social skills curriculum. And uh, what they teach their, their uh, students about uh, how to deal with teasing um, is, and again, this does not have to do with uh, physically being hurt. When there's physical harm, you do not engage in any way. You go to an adult immediately. But for teasing, one of the things that has been found is that if you just go straight to an adult, but that, that's not always the most effective. And sometimes teaching our kids the way to respond to teasing can can reduce the intensity of what they're experiencing. So the first is practicing using calm and confident body language, which, again, for a lot of neurodivergent kids can be difficult to figure out. So it's actually pr uh, practicing a calm and confident body language. And I like to you know kind of work out this scenario. Somebody says, you know, wow, your backpack is awful. And the teacher can say, well, whatever. What do you mean, whatever? Your backpack is awful. And your point is, what do you mean your point is? You have the worst backpack in the world. You, you, what are you, poor? Wow, you really think a lot about me. What? No, I'm not. I'm just saying you have a terrible backpack. See, there you go again. You can't, you just can't stop talking about me. Smiling and walking away. Doing this in a calm, confident manner, which flips the script a little bit, right? Because if that bully, that teaser keeps on talking, then they are just proving the point that they are obsessed with them, that they can't stop talking about me. And again, you don't stick around, you smile, and you walk away. And that's one of the responses uh, from a social skills uh, uh, perspective that we do teach um, uh, uh, our students um, to respond. Um, let's say your child is doing the bullying. Um, what, what do you do for that? Um, so you want to work with the school to understand and find out what kind of behaviors have been occurring, um, uh, accepting behaviors should change if they're acknowledged and work on, um, you know, encouraging relationships with kind children, exposing children to acts of kindness, uh, giving opportunities to act of kindness, um, and and uh, there, there can be done things that can be done if your child is doing the bullying as well. Um, I'm a big fan of mentoring programs. I also work for Mentor MDDC, which is a chapter of the National Mentoring Resource Center. Um, and in my work as a, a school consultant where I've run bullying uh, pro programs, mentoring programs be incredibly powerful. Uh, mentoring programs can have um, students who are older mentoring oftentimes the victims. And a lot of times when you have a connection of, to a mentor who's bigger, who's in a bigger grade than you are, there is a, a feeling of protection. Um, there are people who can stick up for them. People are seen as having a connection to somebody uh, older, or even if it's in the same grade, although we really do encourage there to be different grades of mentoring between student and student, that can make a really big difference. Um, and I like to talk about kind of super soldiers. So here it comes back to, um, I love comic books and referring to Captain America, but you know, one of the things that I like to say is that in a, in a war, right, a small battalion of let's say green berets or highly trained uh, soldiers, can make a massive difference um, as opposed to a large group of somewhat less trained. Um, and when we're doing things on an institutional level, we wanna train all students to be um, doing the, the right things and the kind things, but identifying uh, students who have not only a, a sense of kindness, but also a sense of confidence and social capital uh, and social cachet um, and having them be a part of the program in, in a, in a, in a um, more advanced level, both in terms of, let's say, presentation, as well as being boots on the, on the, on the ground, um, can be a really, really special thing because you have people, again, with that social standing who are, uh, who are quite um, strong in their opposition and their stopping of the bullying that they're seeing. Um, and again, just to end up, 
Um, uh, I've written a book called The Crimson Protector, which is a superhero adventure novel. It teaches tweens and teens how to overcome social anxiety, build confidence, and handle bullying. Available on Amazon and CrimsonProtector.com. It is certainly not the answer to all bullying. Um, and uh, I think can be a part of, uh, as, uh, as Cheerio says, uh, part of a, uh, a, a heart-healthy breakfast. Um, there's a certain could be a part of it. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn over uh, the uh, the um, uh, the mic to Terry, and I uh, would love to take some uh, some questions. Jeff, first of all, that was great. That was really fabulous. Wonderful tools that um, are very usable for parents and for school systems. I just have to change my camera there. Um, I wanted to point out to everybody that Sumaya posted some great resources in the chat uh, for parents who are looking for more information. And of course, Dr. Kranzler has some things that um, he can share as well. He wrote a book called The Crimson, Crimson Protector, right? Which goes right along with the comic book thing. So you'll share that information at the end before we go again, and we'll make sure everybody has that. Um, I just wanted to draw people's attention to that in the chat, but the, and as people are usually it takes them a few minutes to formulate their questions. So we'll give them a few minutes to do that. But in the meantime, there was a um, little bit of a discussion that was happening in the chat about the term disability and the fact that some people who may have, you know, an autism diagnosis really um, use that term and feel empowered by using that term. So it's a little bit of a different take on avoiding using the term entirely. And, and so I just wanted to point that out that there, there are, were some people pointing out that there are some um, ways in which people with that diagnosis do prefer to use the term. And by the way, every single person has a right to identify the way they want to. And that's no different when it comes to neurodivergence. And you can call your neurodivergence anything you want. And frankly, I, I do believe it's important to have diagnostics, but I also feel that if you do connect with that and perhaps don't have a, a, an official diagno a diagnostic, you, you can identify as somebody being neurodivergent. You can call yourself whatever you want. And that really is up to the individual. I wanted, you know, before I was, you know, talking about, you know, using the word uh, autistic, I, I wanted to hit that home, but I want to hit it home again too. That if you, as an autistic individual, say, I want to be talked about as a person with autism or a disability, that is your uh, right, because it is yourself um, that you have a, a right to talk about. Awesome. Thank you for saying that. There's um, a question in the chat about what advice you would give to a parent. I I'm assuming it's a parent. Um, of a kid who's autistic and um, that child has really internalized a very negative view of themselves because of their diagnosis. And how do you sort of approach that? So I, I think it goes back uh, to- Actually, how... hello. Yeah. Uh, this is, it's Samaya. That was my question, not the, from their diagnosis, but from how others have treated them for uh, being autistic. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think that's that's so important to uh, to talk about because the truth is we can talk about whatever we want in our homes and our kids go out into the world. And frankly, if we are parents, we automatically have a lower level of credibility across the lifespan. Uh, right. Um, as, as the great Mark Twain said, at 17, I thought my father a fool. And at 21, I was surprised at how much the old man had learned in four years. Um, but irregardless, our kids do not, you know, will not take our opinions uh, as at a greater um, weight than their peers or from what they see on television. Um, and I think that reframing it as best as you can with the following pieces is, again, this is a tribe. And guess what? In the world, there are a lot of people out there who people treat poorly and treat negatively. And I think going to history of groups who have. Uh, experienced um, negativity because of who they were um, is important. And I think going a little bit into the history and who is in their tribe, who is in their group, who is being harmed um, is really important too. As I was saying before, is kind of number one, taking a look at the famous people who people know who are autistic. I think that's very important. Um, I think that reading uh, autistic uh, books by autistic authors is really important. 
not just people writing about autism, but autistic people writing about their lives. Two of my favorite books are How to Be Autistic by Charlotte Amelia Poe and um, Look Me in the Eyes. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, really kind of connecting with a community too. And, you know, the wonderful thing, and, and I wish there was more of it out there, but there are, I know there's a lot of community building, um, especially in the, uh, with the young adult uh, adults in the Montgomery County and DMV area uh, with autistic um, young adults. And I think that's important to be part of communities. And I do hope to see more um, opportunities uh, be there for both parents as well as uh, high schoolers, middle schoolers, and grade schoolers to form that uh, community. I know there are communities online. I'm always a little bit hesitant when it comes to uh, putting kids in touch with online communities. Um, it has to be really carefully monitored. Um, our neurodivergent population is some of the most vulnerable and often abused online um, individuals. So I'm very hesitant about that piece. Um, and I, my hope is, you know, continue to see in the future people are creating those community spaces because the best way to go back against what people are negative about you is to take pride in the group of people that you belong to. Um, and so I think that is at the core of, uh, uh, of, of fighting against that. There was a question about um, if it would be helpful or harmful to inform a bully about a diagnosis that makes their victim vulnerable to the bully. Absolutely harmful. Thank you for asking that. It's really important because I think that is a very good question because I think many schools believe to do that. That what we need to do is make you friends with them or, or make you have ki a kindness on them. And the reality is the bully already knows that the victim is vulnerable. And all you're doing is adding fuel to the fire so they can do it more effectively. Um, I, I can't say there won't be an exception here and there, but I am vehemently against uh, doing that. Um, so another question here is about uh, when you're talking to autistic people about members of their tribe, I mean, what if they were bullied by members of their tribe? And this person gives an example of Steve Jobs perhaps being one of those people. Yep. And 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 that's the important thing also to, to talk about is that in, and when we talk about famous people, right, there's a, a, there's everybody has pluses and minuses. And there's a lot of people with a lot of problematic pieces. And when you're talking about somebody famous to remember that the negative pieces that that's not due to autism right it's really the successes right and we all you know and and, and there's a lot of documentation of the difficulty steve jobs has and in fact there are some other um famous autistic people who i haven't even listed purposefully um uh, because of some very well documented difficulties um but remembering that and i think that um it's 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 okay to say that it's never all right, whoever you are, it's not a, okay to make fun of you. Even if somebody's like, well, it's okay because I'm also autistic. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that um, various groups have heard that way too often about whatever group there is. It's okay because it's never okay uh, to do that. And by the way, those people who you do identify with, who you who think highly of, and, you know, just like you and me, we, they have a lot of strengths and they have a lot of challenges. And what can be rankle people could be it's, that's not part of the uh, of the autism uh, piece and I think being able also it's also really important too because again helping with flexibility and seeing nuance the ability to see somebody famous who they may look up to as having some pretty significant flaws it's actually a really great thing to be able to introduce so that kids can understand that when they make a mistake it's not over for them mm -hmm. and that nobody is all good or all bad so I think a really great way to introduce a couple of conversations um, that, that, that presents a really nice opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I just want to circle back to the idea that we're talking about neurodiversity, neurodivergence, which includes autism, but also includes ADHD, which is why many people are tuned in tonight. And I'm wondering if, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I might have a little touch of that ADHD. Um, anyway, so if, if people in the audience, you know, remember that this isn't just about autism. This is also about ADHD. I guess, you know, I did have a question which is related to ADHD 
is a more um, widely diagnosed sort of condition. And I don't know if there are resources out there specifically for people who have ADHD to identify as their tribe, because I work with a lot of kids who feel very disheartened by their own, you know, challenges that are related to their ADHD diagnosis, whether they're social challenges or impulsivity challenges, but certainly um, having having social relationships can be really difficult. Um, do you have any resources that you feel speak specifically or in part to um, folks with ADHD as well? But I think really important also when we're talking about, I think you made a really good point, neurodivergence to remember that includes a lot of different components within it. And um, and I, I believe it's the same thing for individuals for individual with ADHD is finding your group. You want to use the word tribe. You want to use your community and finding your identity and finding the pride in that because, um, again, the most successful people in the world are neurodivergent and that includes uh, individuals with ADHD. And so I think connecting, and, and frankly, when we're talking about tribe, we're also talking about um, genetics. You don't pick up autism. You don't pick up ADHD which means that you got it from somewhere. And so if there is, and if there's no connection to a biological family, if there's an adoptive family, um, to, there's more, to, a lot more to talk about that. Um, and I don't think we have the time to go into that. And if there is an awareness of a biological predecessors, um, whether it is the parent themselves or a grandparent who we suspected, even though they didn't provide that diagnosis back in 1947, um, but being able to connect to people who have, who are, who they uh, are, 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 connected to and take pride in being similar to them. And I think that's true of any uh, characteristic, you know, you know, you know, uh, that's kind of like, you know, grandpa sometimes did some of that and boy, boy, did he, was he the, the, the best engineer in his, uh, in, in his crew, right? Like that was, you know, that's kind of the kind of similar and it can, it can be tough also, but man, I, I, lo I love grandpa and I know you love grandpa and boy was grandpa successful as well. So I think um, connecting to them and connecting to, um, to more people in their tribe, I wish there was, more of that too, um, uh, and uh, and again, careful for the online connections. You have to be careful about that. Um, but I do think that anything that can build community and connection is going to be really good um, for for that and for building the pride from undoing the both explicit and implicit um, uh, feedback that they have gotten about who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what you're identifying, this is just my interpretation, so tell me if I'm right on here, is that one of the ways that we can help inoculate young people um, against the negative impact of being bullied or, or even you know, blatantly discriminated against in, in other ways is by building their self-confidence. You know, and building their self-confidence by recognition of the things that they do well and how that can be a real gift and how that could be unique to them precisely because of their diagnosis. And there was an earlier question, um, which I think you did talk about a little bit. And I wonder if you wanted to, to talk another moment about this, about how to, um, the fact that people who are autistic have these really special interest areas and then can, and, and if, if, uh, they're able to really explore those interests. If they have the support from their parents and their schools to explore those interests, they can be amazing you know, individuals and really the best. You kept on saying the best at what they do. And I, I think that's what you were talking about. Um, and I think that's what this, this person was curious a little to know a little bit more about. I think that applies to both people who are autistic and people who have ADHD as well. Uh, absolutely agreed. And, and it's, it's so important and it's very difficult too. Like, it's not just like a breeze I found, right? I, I, I have a, somebody who loves Dungeons and Dragons. I'm going to find a Dungeons and Dragons club. There can be a lot of, again, there's the need for confidence. Well, you know, how do I socially interact? Frankly, in the areas of interest, the need for social skills goes down because a lot of the social skills is going to be, uh, you know, connecting with somebody, making sure that you are, or, you know, reciprocating. Well, if you if you are in a train club and you love trains, and and many of of my clients love the DC Metro, and I've learned a lot about the DC Metro. 
um, especially as being somebody who grew up with the uh, New York MTA. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, learning a lot about that. But finding your group, number one, it lowers the need for all of these very artificial social skills that are expected because people connect like this. A lot of times other, pe other people are also neurodivergent. And one of the things that I, that I, one of the main reasons why I love working with neurodivergent people is that I don't think I've met another group who, as, who are as kind, caring, accepting, and not uh, bigoted as autistic individuals. Um, people think, oh, there's a lower level of, uh, of compassion. That's baloney, right? Compassion may not be expressed because it's not picked up. It's not, the situation's not picked up, but the most compassionate people are neurodivergent people. Um, and they are the kind, and they accept people for who they are. And especially when you, and again, I want neurodivergent people to be with neurotypical people and all of that. And sometimes just finding someone who's just like you and who's as open um, to people like you is really, really helpful. Um, it's really, really helpful to, met, to, to spend time with everybody. And it's also really helpful to be with members of your tribe. And I think a great way to connect um, with people is through those areas of interest. Um, and the more that it can be out there, um, whether it's within a school or outside of a school setting, um, even if it is uh, reaching out and trying to create something of your own, um, it's always helpful to do things within an organization, but that's not always possible. Uh, but anything that can be done to show that um, what they're seeing in school, all the options that people are presenting, I'm I'm the you know basketball player. I'm the person getting straight A's. I'm the whatever. That it is, it is just as fine to be into trains. It is, it is, ju it's just a different um, piece. And that person's into Minecraft, and that person is into Taylor Swift, and this, and I'm into trains. And um, you know, so so I, I think making that a a possibility is harder than it seems. And it is very much uh, worth it. And I think just to follow up on that, um, the idea of special interests um, and the support that kids can get in, in pursuing their special interests. As a psychologist, I run into a lot of situations where, you know, in education, there might be the advice that we shouldn't uh, really allow the kid to get too caught up in their special interests. That's a bad idea. They need to, you know, have a broad range of experience and interests. And I, I know you, I know what your answer is to that. So I'm throwing that out to you just so you can comment on that. No, so, and I think it's really important because I do think that there's two things that are needed, right? So when I talk to, to people about social skills needs, there is a need to be able to connect with the people on a very uh, superficial level who you need to connect that would be your fellow students, coworkers, people who you need something with. And those aren't going to be your best friends, nor do they need to be, right? You do, un and, and again, 150 years ago, if you were a farmer, you didn't have to learn physics and chemistry. You, you only did the thing that you knew and the thing that you loved, because frankly, the way we do things now is unnatural and is an aberration for the entirety of evolution in, the human, uh, in human history, right? So up until recently, it was not an issue. Your special interest was what you did anyway, right? Um, and having the special interest is where you find that level of friendship, the deep friendships, that comfort, where you're not having to think twice about, well, what social skills am, am, am I using? And so, yes, I want people to have some basic level of skill in talking to everybody. And, and unfortunately, and I say it unfortunately because I believe it, you have to have a certain level of skill across the board in academic subjects, even if they have no relation to what you like to do. So have that baseline uh, capability and then recognize that um, that John Popper is the greatest harmonica player ever and he's never played the clarinet and nobody cares. And that's, that's just the way it goes. And so you do you. Good point, good point. Um, I'm... Not sure there are any other specific questions. There are a few more resources. So Maya posted that she started a meetup group for elementary school kids. So that's in the chat. If people want to, you know, scroll through the chats, there are some resources here um, that might be helpful. 
Let's see, here's the question. I'm just gonna read it out loud. Speaking of friends, how do you help autistic kids to understand the various types of friends that not everyone who smiled at them is now a friend and to keep them safe from strangers and bullies? Yeah, that is a, that is a recognized struggle. Um, and in fact, is a, is a component of the uh, peers curriculum. Um, and, and I think that when things become too complicated, it doesn't help. And I think keeping things uh, mathematical and straightforward is really important. And talking about these different levels of connection, right? On one level is complete stranger. Another level is acquaintance. You know who they are. You see them. You're with them repeatedly for because of the circumstances you're in. There is a friend and what that means, the components that are necessary to be considered a friend, the components necessary to be a best friend, and the components, frankly, necessary to be a romantic interest. And I think that if you can keep it at that and then describe the different necessity, the different pieces that make somebody one or the other, that is extremely helpful because when somebody thinks in pictures, in patterns or in numbers, when you put things into visuals, patterns and numbers, it makes it um, uh, more understandable and, and frankly, more relatable. Um, so I do think that's really important because a lot of autistic individuals do make that uh, mistake of, hey, that person smiled at me, we're best friends now. And, and and kind of going more in depth into what those different levels are can be really helpful. There was a great graphic that I remember seeing once upon a time. You know, you've got the person in the middle and you've got a circle right around real close. Like those are your close friends. This, these mm -hmm. are the kinds of things you might share with your close friends, your romantic partners. And then there's another circle, right? So this is the kind of information, the kind of conversation you'd have with those people and then a larger circle. So if we're talking about pictures, that is a helpful yeah. graphic. Yeah, um, and, to and use. I, I love the levels. I just like, hey, level one, level two, level three, let's put numbers next yeah. to this. Yeah, yeah, numbers, pictures. I use stick figures. I'm a terrible artist, but it gets the point across. <laughs> Um, folks were wondering about the resources that we've talked about. Most the resources that you've you're, you've talked about, they will be sent to everybody. Oh, there goes your light. Sorry about everybody that. Who, yeah, the light thought there was nobody in there for me. Everybody who is registered tonight will get a copy of this recording, and they're also going to get um, information about your book, Jeff. They'll also get your um, slideshow separately in addition to the recording. So, and also if you are interested in resources, any, anybody there in the audience and you haven't been keeping track of the chat, there are some resources that are listed in the chat. So go there and take a look at it or take a screenshot before you um, leave tonight. Um, let's see, last question. What can be done in a school to encourage inclusion of autistic kids in group programs by other neurotypical classmates? Like, you know, what strategies can school use, schools use? They, uh, this person doesn't see specific bullying problems, but just not including those people with those diagnoses. And, and what a wonderful question, because, you know, the answer is yes, that should be a focus of schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that proactive measures taken to introduce different social groups to different people, uh, ways of doing that. And I'll leave that to the to the school itself. Um, but creating ways to be with somebody, and I don't know it necessarily needs to be, hey, you should hang out with Tom because Tom's autistic and autism is awesome, right? It may just be more of like, hey, everybody's different. Let's let's get a chance to know. And, and at the same time, right? Because the, the fear that I have about that is, let's say somebody doesn't want to be identified as autistic. What do you do then? It presents a lot of difficulties, especially when there's individuals involved. You know, I, I think there is never anything wrong with doing um, uh, education in general about, hey, this is, uh, these are things that are out there. This person is autistic. Let's talk about what neurodiversity is as a whole. I think talking about that in general and then creating individual relationships through um, uh, intervention, frankly, intervention and uh, and and let's just be honest, the younger it is, the easier it is. Um, sometimes, by the way, sometimes, uh, you know, when high schoolers can be more advanced um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in identity and um, in, in forming social uh, connections. Um, but I do think that, uh, that you're 100% right. Let's focus on it. Let's bring an understanding of autism as a whole 
And let's create actively friendships between people who would not otherwise be friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as a school psychologist, I often would recommend to teachers who um, would come to me, they would have some child in their classroom that had some really significant differences and who might have some extra supports or things in place that the other students didn't have. And the teacher would be like, well, how do I deal with that? You know, maybe this kid has a behavior support plan and they're getting a certain reward system that none of the other kids are our party to, and, and teachers were always really concerned about that. And I would encourage them to just, you know, do a lesson on differences. Let's, we don't even need to talk about, we could talk about specific diagnoses as being different types of differences, but everybody's different and that's really valuable. And we should honor that and respect that and include everybody because there's so much richness that we can be gained from that. Um, and I think if teachers were to teach that early on, our overall level of tolerance and sensitivity to different people and our acceptance of people into different groups would be, you know, much better. But I tend to be a little bit of a Pollyanna. So <laughs> that was my spiel. I don't know if you have a spiel that you give teachers when you're talking to them about specifically neurodiversity and how to teach that in the classroom. Uh, I, I wish that was actually something I had to deal with because no one's ever reached out to me on that. And I really do hope that comes time because, you know, and I, I kind of uh, I learned this from my grandmother. My grandmother was a, a public school teacher in uh, in Baltimore for many years. And uh, she told me a story that um, she had a student who had been who was about to come in and um, he had experienced um, uh, some uh, difficulty, some um, very clear disfigurement um, due to an injury. Um, and she, before the student came in, uh, came and just sat down with her kids and had a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't, a, you know, a, any like, you need to accept everybody who's different than you is a diversity. This is this. It's just, look, everybody's different. Um, this person's coming in and I expect you to treat them the same way you treat everybody else. And her class did. And I think doing something as straightforward as that and just having those conversations rather than having lectures, especially when you know there's somebody's going to be coming in or, or you're seeing some different pieces, having those conversations as conversations is so important. And I hope um, that schools are able to do that on a, on a more um, human and individual and, uh, and connective level um, in the future. Awesome. Well, I think that um, we don't have any other questions that are popping up, so it might be time to, to say goodbye and remind people that we will be sending the recording out and your, and your slideshow um, and a link to your book, I think, of course. Also, I want to remind people that our next, our next lecture, and I'm just going to check the date to make sure that I have it. I should know what the date is. Um, Myself and another board member, Cheryl Gedzeman, we're going to be giving a joint presentation on how to survive and thrive on your family vacation. Because of course, in April, people are gonna be planning their vacations in the summer. And uh, this just sort of came about one day we were having a board meeting and we were talking about the challenges of going on vacation, period. I mean, just for families to go on vacation. But also if you've got a child who has special needs of any sort who tends to be you know have a lot of sensory needs or activity needs or you know special interests like how do you um what are some tips and tricks for for making that a positive uh, experience so we're going to be giving that talk on tuesday the 16th that's our next presentation um, and Jeff, this has been a fabulous opportunity for us to learn some more from you. We really appreciate you being such an expert in this field and offering all the resources that you do. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I truly appreciate it.